What messages about Christ can we find in Narnia and messages about us? That's what we'll talk about today. To know what would have happened, child? No, nobody has ever told that. But anyone can find out what will happen. Aslan, talking to Lucy. I have to tell you, Narnia is not my favorite C.S. Lewis book. I enjoy watching it every time there's something to watch. I've seen all the movies and all the streaming. I have the audiobooks that are dramatized. It's always fascinating. I love the messages inside of Narnia. And so what we're going to talk about today are some messages inside of the Chronicles of Narnia that are useful to us, things that we can learn. We'll start out with some basic messages of how Christian the Chronicles of Narnia are and some of the main messages we can take away from it. I think sometimes we read it as children. We don't get the main ideas, the main concepts of it. And then at the very end of this podcast, we're going to talk about two particular quotes Points in two particular books that I think are just so valuable to teach us about how we can walk with Christ in this life of uncertainty. It will help us for sure. The kids are the first disciples, right? In the sense, Aslan the lion, he is Jesus, and he is sacrificed on the stone table, which is broken in half. He comes back to take out evil. He clearly, this is a Christian allegory. We can see the messages of Jesus in here. And so obviously the very first message in this whole piece has to do with believing in Jesus, having faith in Aslan. He represents it. And so Lucy is the very first person to meet Aslan, and she goes and gets her brothers and sisters to come and follow him too, right out of Andrew going and getting Peter, right? I mean, we have seen this in the Gospels for sure. It's an important message of telling other people and getting them to come with them and see Christ for themselves. Another big message in the movie itself has to do with forgiveness. We have Edmund who betrays his siblings. And if I make my friends watch one more Narnia thing and they have to say, just shut up about the Turkish delight. This kid for a dessert gave up his family because he was lured away by the evil witch. But in the end, Aslan forgives Edmund and convinces everybody else to forgive him. And when he sacrifices his own life to save Edmund's life, right there, that is the Christian message. When Aslan comes back, there are certainly messages about integrity, bravery. We we have seen many cases where these kids had to stand up to the face of evil to face something that was difficult, hard, rescue people. We saw the power of love and compassion, the siblings that they have for each other, the loyalty, and at times the lack of loyalty, but also to other people, that they will go back and save people and and serve other people because they are trying to reflect that. And whenever selfish temptation gets involved in there, which you think about if you've ever read it, there's a point in the book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, where there's a, I think he's a cousin, Eustace Scrub, and he is a brat from the day one. He's just this bratty boy. And when he experiences life as a dragon, because he's horrible, I think is why he's a dragon, it humbles him and turns him into someone who is selfless. We see in the last book, which is called The Last Battle, that Narnia gets destroyed and a new Narnia, a perfect Narnia will be created. Obviously, a reflection of what the new heaven and the new earth is going to be like. I think the biggest thing that gets you to whenever you're looking at the Chronicles of Narnia is the struggle between good and evil. There's Aslan and his disciples, and then there's the evil white witch, the green witch, and then the people who follow these witches. And obviously, this is this whole idea of warfare between good and evil. But the idea, too, is that we see critters and people fall into the lure of the devil, even Edmund himself, right? Good kid, part of the siblings in there. People get lured away for many different purposes. And it's lies. It's the lies of evil. And even Edmund in his Turkish delight, he was lied to about not being important enough, not being the leader of the family, being bossed around by his siblings. You know, that was just 
That was just outright devilry stuff right there. And it all culminates then in forgiveness and redemption for Edmund and for other people. So you can see this is truly a very Christian message. And when I look at the books, you see the creation of Narnia as Aslan sings all of existence into the world. Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe is the crucifixion and the resurrection. Prince Caspian is restoring the religion after corruption took over things. The boy and his horse is talking about conversion of someone who was against Aslan. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader is about spiritual life and how to live this life. The Silver Chair talks about this war with the powers of darkness. And of course, the last battle is the fight, the final fight with the Antichrist, who is the ape. The end of the world and the last judgment. C.S. Lewis himself was an expert about allegory and wrote fiction books and maybe some things you never heard of. But he was in a bid to try to write this children's story. And even I have cousins who in eighth grade Jewish school wrote their final papers on The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I wonder if they knew this was a Christian allegory. It can reach people because of taking complex ideas and making them more visceral to our lives in this kind of fantasy realm. What I want to focus on more is this message that happened in the book Prince Caspian, because I think that this is a big pitfall for a lot of us. It's the thing that resonated the most for me. But it comes from this passage inside of the book where Lucy says to Aslan, asking him, wouldn't it be good if the people knew that everything was going to be turning out all right? You scared us all by dying. And Aslan says nothing about it. He doesn't say anything. And so she says, you mean, Lucy says, that it would turn out all right somehow. But how? Please, Aslan, I do not know. And then Aslan says, to know what would have happened, child. No, nobody has ever told that. Oh, dear. But anyone can find out what will happen. And if you go back to the others now and wake them and tell them you have seen me again, that you must all get up and follow me, what will happen? There's only one way of finding out. It reminds me of the women at Jesus' tomb, where they go back and tell the others they had seen Aslan again. It is a really important part about how Jesus tried to tell his disciples that he was going to die and that he was going to come back. And they didn't hear it. They couldn't get it. They couldn't understand it. But now that it happened, Lucy should go back and tell them again. And I think the other point of this, too, is that we think, well, could we have seen about the past? What could we have seen what would have happened if something else had happened in an alternate universe? I've watched that uh, Dark Matter series on Apple TV, and it's all about one person goes into an alternative universe because the guy, him, in that universe made better decisions, and he wanted to steal that guy's life. And when he was asked, well, why did you do this? He said, well, I thought you'd like my life. He didn't even like his life. And so he was trying to pick a different option. You can't go back and ever figure out, what if I did this? Or what if I did that? Or what if I went a different direction? You could sit there and think about it your whole time. I think about it too. I wanted to be an astronomer. I saw there were no jobs in astronomy, so I left. What if I had gone that direction? I had good enough grades. I had enough work. Probably could have gotten a very good scholarship. In fact, in my psychology research I did with a professor, she was willing to go to the mat for me to get me into graduate school at Ohio State. And she thought I could get either pretty close to a free ride or pay just a very little because she knew the hard work I had done. What if I taken that route? Or what if I went to school in Upper Peninsula, Michigan, where I was from, instead of going out of state and going to another school? I never would have met my friend who preached the gospel to me and I became a Christian. Would God have made it happen in a different way? I think so. But, you know, we can't go back in time and sit there and make these decisions if we hadn't done this mistake or we pick this other path. 
if we could only have done this or only have done that, we could have prevented suffering or made things better. And Lucy, Aslan doesn't leave it there. You can't know this. The good will come. The forgiveness will come. I think the apostles must have thought this way too. If only we kept Jesus out of Jerusalem. If only we decided to go preach in Rome instead of going and preaching in Israel. If only we had done X, or even the thoughts of Judas. If I had not turned against Jesus and sold him out, this could have all been different. Judas killed himself over it. You cannot go into that direction. But instead, we look at all of this and know there's always redemption. There's always the chance to be born again in the Spirit and always that option to see God in the light, to to see that offer that Jesus offers us in John, where he says, if you follow me, you will be in the light, which means we will see all the things. We will see God better because we're in the light. We will see ourselves and the other people around us better because we have light. When we're in the dark, we stumble around in the dark. And that's what God offers us. Don't worry about these other paths. Don't worry about these other things you've done. Instead, go forward. Walk in the light. That is such a powerful message that we get right out of Narnia, a kid's book. And I read it as a kid. And I knew it was trying to get at higher truths. I just, hap- I just didn't happen to know that it was a Christian higher truth. Wow. Now that I can understand it, it means so much more to me even when I don't really like the Narnia books all that much, but the message is fantastic. This last message was the one that stuck with me the most out of all the books I read out of the Narnia story, this message, where this boy named Shasta is on a horse and they are going through the woods. Aslan is running to the side of them both. And they're having this conversation about all these things that happen to other people, their fates. The boy discovers that he's actually a prince. He didn't know he was a prince. He's a prince. And so this long journey, he finally meets Aslan, and he talks about this other story and her fate and what happened to this other person. And Aslan says, I tell you your own story, not hers. No one is told any story but their own. God's path for us is about our path for us, and we should focus on that path of us following Jesus. We shouldn't look around and see how other people follow Jesus. It means that we all have our own journey. We have our own directions, and we have to have faith in God. When we're following the light in the desert, as the Exodus Hebrews follow the pillar of light, everybody has their own story too. They have their own pluses and minuses. They have their own experiences, struggles. We shouldn't go around judging them intruding on them. I think because we get jealous. We get so jealous of other people because we look at that other person and say, how come I had such a hard life? I grew up in poverty. I had an alcoholic father. These horrible things happened to me. But I see other people like my friend Em, who grew up in a great family, a loving family, and had support from her family. You could get jealous. You could get envious. You could get bitter if you just sit there and you look at that other person's life and say, why couldn't I have had that life? Why couldn't I have the happy family? Why did I have to go through this other kind of family? I'm sure it happens all the time to everybody because we look at people and say, well, that person's rich or that person's happy or that person never experienced a health crisis. And we could go on all day long, sitting there and comparing ourselves, comparing what we have, what we don't have, what they have, being jealous about it. This message of just understanding we only know our own story. Nobody has told another story but their own. He can't go in to the reasons why this person was rich because that's their own story. And they will have, I can assure you, their own great moments, their own pitfalls, even in the wealth of life, not just money, but great families or great circumstances or perfect health or perfect teeth or gorgeous looks, whatever it is you think that you wish you had that you don't have, they have their own story. They have their own sins. They have their own struggles. They have their own tears. You do too. And you have to focus on your own story. 
you know, that is something I think we can all think about a lot is to not get caught up in other people's lives, to not get envious and jealous of other people's lives and understand their struggles are hard, even as ours are hard. And we shouldn't go around comparing our lives with other people. God has a path for us. God knows us by name. And all we have to do is follow him, follow in his life and believe in him. And we all get to rejoice in that same place together, regardless of the path that we get there through. The powerful message that comes before that statement, too, is essentially Shasta doesn't recognize the lion, Aslan. As people don't recognize Jesus in their own lives, Shasta thinks that there are many lions out there. There are many people who were there. And Aslan says this, I was the lion who forced you to join with Erebus. I was the cat who comforted you among the house of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I, as the lion, who gave the horses the new strength of fear for that last mile so that you should reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion you do not remember who pushed the boat in which you lay, a child near death, so that it came to shore where a man sat, wakeful at midnight to receive you. All these things that we think we see in the world of many lions, of many pushes and nudges and circumstances in our lives, it is always Christ behind that. He says, I am the only lion you met in all your journeying. And I think that that's what we should walk away with in this particular message is that every time we see Christ, it is always Christ that makes sure these things happen. It is only one lion and it is only one Christ. And he is always the same Christ. Wow. So my challenge to you is think of all the places Christ has been in your life, behind the scenes, being the cat who helped you to shore, bringing you together with other people, bringing all the good in your life. How many times have you seen Jesus in your own life in the shape of other things that you never recognized him? I hope you enjoyed that. We could spend all sorts of weeks talking about Narnia, but I wanted to grab some messages. It meant a lot to me in that story, and I hope they meant a lot to you. But if you have other parts of the Narnia that you have special meaning with, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear about your reactions to Narnia and where you think these messages that come out of Narnia are just so powerful. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me and tell me your favorite parts in the Chronicles of Narnia. I'd love to hear what really meant a lot to you. And remember... Our path in our own story is always going to be small steps with Jesus walking right beside us. <laughs>